Okay, well, I want to thank Sarah for uh, um, giving us the grant to do this project. Um, a little bit of a spoiler alert, a lot of it wasn't really successful, but the whole thing is meant to be a learning experience, right? Uh, education is, you know, last uh, word in Sarah, so this has been an education for us. Um, so Rebecca and I were on her family land. She's a fourth generation farmer. We're located in North Kansas City, about 45 minutes. Uh, this is our farm. Um, down there in the left corner, we have, that's where our house is. We have a barn with our packing room, our certified kitchen. Uh, we have a greenhouse, passive solar. We have one high tunnel. We have uh, two movable chicken uh, coops. We have an irrigation pond there with solar panels. So this is kind of some of the details. We met on a CSA farm um, back in 2001. Uh, Rebecca uh, wanted to come back to her family farm and to you know, improve it and to keep it from just becoming another lot of houses. And um, so the CSA was really the model for us. At our peak, we were up around 100, close to 150 members for 31 weeks. Um, we have about uh, five acres, five and a half, that's actually able to be cultivated over about a 20-acre area that we grow on. This is some of our vegetables. You know, we have a diversified operation, which is a really nice um, model. Uh, you know, as um, been talking, diversity is always good. And for us, you know, we get to eat a diverse diet because we're growing all these things. Our CSA model is participatory. Our members come out and they help with the harvest. We have what's called a core group. They help to manage the CSA. Um, that's the model of the farm where we met. And it's just a great way to get um, all, you know, a host of generations, even from one family, to come out and participate in agriculture. This is our certified kitchen that we had built right after it was completed. Uh, 2016, we decided to kind of diversify our farming operations and to um, have a, a fermenting. So that would mean we need to grow a lot of brassicas, so we wanted to look at different ways to raise the brassicas without having to do a lot of mulching. Uh, we're in our, um, it's like our second year of, of fermenting. We like to say we have a kitchen without a, a stove in there. Um, it was a good model. You know, it's a low uh, energy type of value-added product. You chop everything at room temperature. The fermenting happens at room temperature, and then you store the product back in the cooler um, until you need to jar it. So we already have a cooler, and we only we didn't need to have a stove or heat stuff up. And we're on the shelves on a at a handful of uh, retail outlets in Kansas City area, as well as selling to our members in farmers market. So our fertility plan. Um, I'm sure everybody that's talking about soil, it's, it's going to be pretty much the same thing. Um, and and uh, like Jeff was saying, you really need commitment. So we make sure we feed the soil a diverse and balanced meal. Um, we try to amend every bed each year with some type of cover crop, or we buy compost, um, mineral addition. We now have two uh, laying flocks of about 70, 80 hens, and they we fence in a yard 50 by 100 feet. You know, we can leave them in an area for about two months and move them around the farm. So we can uh, um, fertilize a good acre of land just with our, our hens. And we do, like I said, a lot of cover cropping. You know, we, um, this is like our uh, Sudan grass and cow peas or crotalaria. So we have a flail mower. Normally what we would do is we'd, we'd grow it, we'd chop it down, we have a, it's called a spader. It kind of digs, digs it in. It helps. It doesn't create the hard pan that like a, a tiller will. Um, so we call this our chewing step. As we've been doing more and more um, farming, we're trying to do this less, you know, not use the spader just to till stuff in, but to mainly use it as a way to incorporate cover crops. We incorporate them. We also do a lot of hay. Um, this is compost from a company called Missouri Organics. Um, they're a local Kansas City company that's been growing, and we're able to get um, truckloads of compost. Sometimes we'll use uh, you know, a dry uh, bagged fertilizer. We use Fertrell. 
it's kind of handy at times if you want to add some fertility to a bed and it's kind of been out of the rotation or you haven't been able to time things properly. And then here's our, our hens. We really like it when uh, we can raise a cover crop and put the hens in and have them to, to eat the cover crop. Or we run them through our high tunnel in the spring after we're done with our uh, extended season of the previous fall and the spring. They've been a great way to improve the fertility in the high tunnel. You know, they provide a lot of phosphorus. So one of the things you learn and realize what it is is that they don't really process phosphorus. So I think the phosphorus in the feed kind of um, goes through them. And it's where we are, that's one of the more limiting uh, nutrients is the phosphorus. And so this has been our, our results, just using our farming practices. As you can see, I've been farming for um, 16 years. I used to be an environmental engineer. I used to do a lot of environmental um, sampling and analysis and treatment system design and monitoring. So around 2004, I believe it was, I decided, well, I should maybe plot our soil organic matter. And it's been really instructive. Um, it shows that it bounced around between 2 and 3% for a long time. And it actually kind of went down. And then after 2008, it's, it's been trending up. And um, one of the things we're trying to do in promoting our CSA and promoting our ferments is to talk about that, how, how the value that's in that. And I think next door they're talking about how to quantify that value. And um, I think that's important. So for the cover crop project, the idea was rather than um, mulching, as you saw, doing on our um, brassicas, we were able to, we've been able to raise cover crops historically, raise cover crops, roll it down, and, and plant into that. So we were going to um, do that for cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli. And then we also have uh, tomatoes that we wanted to do. So we started out in 2014. Actually, 2013 is when we started by um, raising our crops, the rye vetch. We, uh, uh, Dr. Ron Morse from Virginia Tech, he was our technical assistant. Um, and so he helped us kind of, he helped us build the no-till planting aid and um, he gave us some advice. So that's just a flail mower where we turned off the, the blades. You know, it's got a big heavy roller on it. We were able to roll down the cover crops. So this was like step one. Everything looked like it's going to be perfect. It rolled down really well. It was a real good mix of rye and vetch. Um, we were really happy uh, the vetch came back, but, you know, that was fine. We didn't care too much. We mowed it down, did that a couple times, and it kind of disappeared. And, but then the, the weeds started. So uh, bindweed was a, a big issue. Where we were doing this, turns out we had a heavy bindweed problem. We had some other areas where we were doing it. You know, we're all in the grassland area in the middle of, you know, June, July, every seed of grass is going to start to come up no matter what. And so uh, in talking to, to Dr. Morse, you know, he said, you really need a stale seed bed if you're going to do this. You know, his work was down at Virginia Tech, kind of up in the mountains. And it's really a whole different soil growing season and um, what's favored. So all this was happening, but we figured, you know, this is a, a test. We need to kind of see what we can do. So... Um, First thing we did is we took our farm crew out there and we weeded and kept track. And I think it took, you know, eight hours worth of work just to do like this 40 foot stretch of two beds. So, you know, we got that on the record. It's like, okay, hand weeding isn't going to work. And then we tried organic uh, herbicides. We're not certified organic, but we um, follow a NOP. Um, and we tried two different types of basically kind of, uh, you know, citric acid um, type uh, insecticide. But all it does, it just burns off the top growth. It did nothing to stop the, the growth. So we kind of had to abandon that. Um, we tried it again. Well, we'll talk about other attempts. But basically, you know, we can get good stands of cover crops, and they're easily rolled and crimped with a flail mower. Um, the... the Weed pressure in June and July was significant. So our cover crops are rolled down. 
like the, maybe the last week of May or so, somewhere in there. That's kind of typical from where we are. We're not going to plant our brassicas. We don't start them in the greenhouse until the first, second week of June. So that whole time period that rolled down is just sitting there. And that's when all this weed pressure comes up. Um, I'll show you the wet times where it's hard to do. And like I said, the weeding and the organic herbicides really weren't a solution. So the next step was this no-till planting aid. So you roll it down, and the idea is you can just cut furrows um, in the uh, rolled down cover crop, and then we were going to bring our transplanter through and have it spaced at that same two-foot spacing and, and plant. So at the beginning, I thought, oh, we had this old piece of equipment laying around. Um, from what I can tell, it'll all be, okay. we'll just be able to kind of redo this. Well, Dr. Moore said those coulters were way too small. Um, once I put that toolbar on our tractor, I realized it was a diamond pattern instead of a square pattern, and I had bought a square clamp, and so there were all sorts of, you know, just uh, farm hack complications. I hooked it all up to kind of see how it might look, and it, the coulter was so big that it wasn't long enough, so we had to do, uh, we did an extension to put the fertilizer shoe on, and then it still wasn't good enough, so then we ended up putting a, um, getting another piece of steel that extended the length of it so we could separate all those. And um, so in the end, we got it built. And it worked well. Um, see, it's a little tilty there. We got an old tractor. But it would drag through, and it would cut the furrow. Um, you'd have to uh, watch about stuff kind of get snagged. Um, you know, we kind of rigged that up so there'd been be some things we would trim it trim off to keep from snagging, and uh, you can kind of see there it, the shovel went in there, the fertilizer knife, it cut a nice furrow. So if we were going to come through with transplants, we would have been able to um, do that. So the no-till planting aid, farm hacking was fine rather than uh, buying a new one. But um, if we had to do it again, we'd probably go to equipment supplier and and try and fabricate it from new pieces of equipment. It was really a great tool. We may use it in the future, too. If there's a really wet period and we can't get in somewhere and we don't want to um, do any serious tilling, we could always kind of maybe drag that through to create a, a planting row. We held a couple feed field days, too. It was tough to time doing the roller crimping with our field days, but um, we were able to, to show some equipment at the same time that we were um, having our field days. So 2015 was a seriously wet year. So I don't know if you can read all this, but from, the, from May 5th until July 20th, we had 35 inches of rain over 74 days. And so it was just consistent. I mean, it was really bad. Um, that was the year I decided I was going to start collecting records, so I was kind of glad I did that. It, um, it really showed this that's a year's worth of rain for us. We even had a hailstorm at one point through there, right during strawberry season, and they just, Rebecca said, it looks like little fairy punches on the strawberries. And so it kind of destroyed that. Um, you know, we were trying to, to still do things, you know, probably shouldn't have. Um, this is an example. This area had been, I don't think we even really had a chance to roll it down, or I might have tried rolling that down, and it was just a mess. So I talked to Joan, and I was like, okay, this year we're, we're, you know, we're extending the whole project, and that was fine. Um, so um, 2015 was kind of <coughs> off the books. Another part of it was a cedar evaluation. We were just going to buy a regular um, grain drill. You know, it's one of those things everybody says, oh, you can buy them, they're all over the place. And I went looking over and over over again. So we have um, like six-foot beds, six-foot wide beds. And, you know, I really wanted like, a, you know, get eight rows in that six-foot, eight, nine rows, and have something that's designed to, to put grain seed in the ground and just could not find anything anywhere um, used that size. So we decided to do was to buy um, some vegetable seeders. And so these are for coal, you know, Planet Junior vegetable seeders. Bought a new toolbar, hooked that up, 
And the idea was, well, we'll do like two passes, and that'll be our cover crops. So uh, what we also do, and normally uh, we've always done in the past, is to use a broadcast seeder and then um, come through with a harrow. We would mix our cover crops ahead of time and inoculate the legumes and then add the grain, mix it up, and then just spread it all together. Um, just one thing as an aside, you know, talking about sticking with game plans, Jeff was in improving. We have a, a saying on our farm, which is from uh, Dr. Deming, who was a, a quality engineer, um, improve constantly and forever. So we're always doing that. And we was at a conference, the um, PFI conference, and we are talking about with cover crops, having a more diverse mix. You know, if you have up to eight seed, uh, different um, seeds, you may actually be able to plant and have stuff to even come up in a drought. In a drought, just the that diversity creates this communication that we still haven't learned about that makes the whole grow better. So we like doing a mix of cover crop seeds. You know, it's pretty much legume and grain. Harrow it in. So with the um, grass seed or with the, the the vegetable seeders at first. I was looking at putting just an individual, like that's veg seed in one a hopper and then something else in the other. Then I'd have to calibrate them all because the vegetable planters don't say, you know, veg seed. Um, and in the end, I decided to mix them. So we could just, hit, okay, everything's at whole 32 and, and that's a good mix for, for all this. Now that's a little crooked, but you can see we pulled it across and, you know, we'd get decent. I kind of wanted to a little, a few more rows, um, and stuff grew halfway decent. And then later I went and decided to shift them all to one side and go up and back, because they were kind of going on top of each other. They weren't quite staggered the way I want. And with cover crops, you know, it's difficult to sometimes get them in at the same time that you've kind of stale seed bedded. So that was one of the big things that we need to work on more and more. Um, so this is uh, Sudan grass and cow peas. We did a couple uh, as part of the study was to compare these two seeding methods and you know weigh the cover crop and see which works better. So broadcast seeding versus the coal. So in June, um, that was more with a spring cover crop, I believe, would have been like oats and peas. The, um, the cedar did better, 13%, but then the, the one that was done in the summer, we actually better with the broadcast. And I think the reason for that is because part of the broadcast seeding is a harrowing to, to put the seeds into the ground. So depending on your timing of when you were able to get in there and cultivate, that kind of last harrow, I think, helped with the, um, keeping the weed pressure down. So we haven't used the coal anymore, but we got a new uh, full-time farmer, uh, somebody that's worked with us before, and so we may go back to, to, to trying to use the tractor to do more of our seeding, because um, a consistent cover crop is, is one of the things that um, we try to work with. Like last year, it didn't rain at all. And if we maybe had better seed to soil contact somehow, we might have had better germination of our cover crops. There's just some more pictures of the cover crops. So this was one where it worked well. You can see that's cow peas and, and Sudan grass. So it's something to still consider. You may have other pieces of equipment that you can seed your cover crops with on your farm. So like I said, conclusions, you can use a vegetable seeder. Um, I would blend seeds and just have one uh, seed hole or whatever your equipment uses. Um, I couldn't quite get everything evenly spaced, and then the harrowing um, isn't necessarily a bad thing to do. So then in 2016, we tried it again, and you can see what came up was mainly vetch. You know, we, we seeded this in the fall of 2015, and for some reason, we've had this happen before, the rye doesn't come up that well, but the vetch does. But we still worked with it and rolled stuff down. Um, 
that's the flail mower. We are able to get that as part of the project. It's really nice to have a, it's a, a, a good quality Alamo. And we had some of the same problems with bindweed, so we just kind of abandoned it. These are the same conclusions as the other one. And then we just still had a lot of rain issues. So one of the other things we were trying are um, no-till for tomatoes. So with our CSA, we raise tomatoes, and then um, we like to have a, a second planting, just because the first one kind of dies off and doesn't do as well. So we always had we had some hun uh, summer uh, heat set tomatoes that we use. Um, Bella Rosa is the variety. They're a caged tomato, also a determinant, so we don't have to do all the stringing. You can raise them, plant them, put a cage around it, and you don't necessarily forget them. But it, it, they're they take less care, and they're more like a grocery store type tomato, but if you leave them on the vine long enough um, and let them ripen, you know, using organic growing methods and improving your soil, they do have some, some good flavor and texture. So the, um, so that whole area had uh, Ryan vetch, and um, so we rolled, rolled stuff down and on one bed for the tomatoes, and then the other one we um, tilled the cover crop in like we would normally do. We tried to do that ahead of time and let it rest. And then we came through and we planted our tomatoes. Everything's at two foot spacing. I think somewhere in here I say I think we had close to 50 tomatoes per row. Um, and so the one on the left, we, we get a lot of hay. We're able to get hay from um, other farmland that Rebecca's farm owns or family owns. Hay mulch. And then on the right, uh, we did, I believe, somewhere in there at some point do a little bit of extra mulching, but that's the rolled down cover crops. So you can see that the mulch ones on the left, they're a little more robust than the ones on the right. And um, over time, um, you know, we didn't do a lot of weeding on the ones on the right. We did some just to keep them away from the plants, but the idea was to try and have it be a, a minimal care system. And you can see that the ones that were um, um, in the cover crop that was turned under did better. They, they had nice fruit set. And so here's the data. So with the hay mulch, we had almost three times the amount of um, tomatoes that we were able to harvest. So the rolled crimped crops, you know, they helped keep the weeds down during the early growth stage. Everything kind of got established pretty well. But the spaded and hay mulch beds gave us three times the yield. And, you know, we're, the thought with us is that maybe in a more mature um, no-till system that you might get better nutrient uptake. But we feel that by, by spading in, you know, all that vetch and everything and kind of getting more of a mixing of the nutrients we were able to get more nutrients released and that's part of the reason why we got um, a higher yield and so here's some costs that were associated with the project so the no-till planting aid you know doing kind of the farm hack and the likes cost us about 1100 bucks um, imagine if you did it um, from scratch it might be, you know, closer to $2,000. And then we got a used flail mower. And then we had to, uh, we had about $4,000 figured in for the cedar. And I thought I'd be able to find a used grain drill, but we couldn't. So that's what that took. And that was all brand new equipment. And, um, yeah, I think that got plenty of time here for questions then. And that's pretty much it. So, who has some questions? The question is how much horsepower it took to pull the no-till planting aid. So, that tractor that we were using, that's Rebecca's um, grandfather's tractor. It's a Farmall 504 and it has about 45 horse. And um, it, uh, so, uh, you know, at least probably 20 horsepower per per coulter and um, fertilizer shoe.
because it did, you know, you could definitely feel some drag on it, but I don't know what the limits were. So the question was, will we use a, um, a sweep to maybe undercut all the mulch? And um, no, we hadn't really thought about that. I think the idea of the, the rolling down is that everything's kind of all attached and um, so we, we didn't really look at that. We've been using sweeps more and more on the farm to reduce our tillage. Like we'll have our chickens run through an area and there'll be next to nothing there, but you can't quite plant. So we will um, try and use a sweep just to break up the first inch so it's kind of more of a shallow tillage. And then, I don't know if I have a picture of it here. Oh, yeah, well there it is. So we have a Alice, this was another field day. Um, we have an Alice Chalmers G tractor. It's a 1948 model tractor. And there was another SARE project a long time ago, Ron Colsa down in New York, he um, electrified it. So we have um, 48 volts on that tractor. It's basically a golf cart um, size uh, engine. And we use that all the time. You can see those are, uh, that's a cultivator on it right now. The, the G is belly mounted implement, so you can see what's going on. Um, one of the other things we do a lot with it is we use discs on this a lot. So we have a toolbar that goes right out to the edge of where the wheels are, and they're discs. And so we'll drive along and we'll basically make a raised bed. And our, you know, we have a lot of heavy soils. We have less soil, but then um, uh, clay and glacial till not far underneath. So when we get those heavy rains, if we don't have our beds shaped, um, all that water will just smear everything over, but if, if the beds are shaped well, water will at least run down the gutters and stay in the gutters and we'll have some nice fluffy soil on top. So we are, like I said, we're, we're moving as much as we can towards a more reduced tillage and mainly using uh, our tillage to incorporate cover crops. Yeah. We had moved it to different areas, yeah, you know, the one year with all the, the water, some of the areas we were trying, we weren't even, even able to um, do that with. But um, yeah, we have friends in Kansas City, other farmers that do no-till and, and they have a lot of, a lot of luck. Um, but they've actually gone to hogs right now to kind of go across their land because they have a perennial weed pressure. So no-till does have that issue, but if you're able to build up, you know, more of the uh, mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, that may be a lot of the benefit to, to really doing as little disturbance as possible. What was the planting depth, depth in the cedar? With the, those earthways, um, they pretty much just have this, like, shoe that hangs down, and we didn't really adjust it too much as long as it would kind of... Um, cut an opening and then be able to drop the seed down the chute and then it has a little follower that, that covers it up. Is so, really yeah, you know, it probably wasn't much more than an inch to an inch and a half, you know, because it's a vegetable seeder, so you're really not going too deep. Cole, Planet Junior, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, you know, we've kind of seen too that um, you know, those, they're not no-till seed, they don't really drill seed, and so they may act different if we, if you were doing an area that had been spaded not too long ago, you know, so it depended on the, the, the soil condition, what had previously happened. Mm -hmm. Question was, what is our cropping system? So, yeah, we had 150 members CSA um, at this time, two full-time apprentices, and, um, Sometimes we'd have other farm help too. And so we were farming close to five acres. And with that, every year we would try and, like when the broccoli came out of production in the spring, make sure we put down cover crops of a summer cover crop. 
And then right now, we scaled back, so um, we're only growing about two to two and a half acres. And in 2017, we cook, took what we call sabbatical year. We cut our CSA in half. Um, it's only every other week, so we could concentrate on our fermenting business. Our business model, the idea is to get back to the point where we're making the same amount of income. Half of it's the CSA, and then half of it is the, the ferments. And we spent a lot of 2017 trying to stale seed bed a lot of our beds. So um, we had some areas we left them open, and then we'd go through with like a sweep cultivator and, and try and knock down the weeds just as they were, were starting. And then um, depending on the time of year, so our spring we'll plant um, like either oats or barley with, um, with field peas in the summer. It tends to be sorghum sedan grass with crotillaria or cow peas. And then in the overwintering, we do the rye vetch. But then sometimes we also do oats and peas near the end of um, summer to have a cover crop that we can maybe turn in before um, winter. So one thing we do, um, just because we're vegetable farmers and you really need kind of a prepared bed in the spring to plant in, We'll do a certain amount of cover cropping in the fall and then uh, turn that under kind of as late as we can, maybe the first week of October or, or spring and or fall cover cropping. And so it'll actually be, um, won't have anything planted in it over the summer or over the winter, but then all that freeze thawing makes it like a perfect soil to plant in in the spring. We got to see beets and carrots or do different things. So. Um, and as you can see, our, our organic matter has gone up. So we feel that it shows that it, it's, a, it's a productive system as far as the soil. Um, and like I said, we try and turn it under right before winter, so biological activity starts, but a lot of that biomass is still in there so that it gets um, released a little bit more in the spring and summer. Yeah, so you know it's it's a little inexact, but um, it was just something we're kind of a good faith effort to demonstrate that our soil organic matter is going up. So it's whatever samples we take in a year. We have two different fields. If you went back to like the first picture, so the fields on the left over here. Here, this is what we call our home field. They they tend to be drier in the spring, and then we we call this our um, the pond field. So we've gotten to the point where we're going back and forth now with soil samples, and so um, that's kind of what the data is is just whatever we had for that year. Well, um, you know we're growing for our ferments and for the CSA, and like I said, one thing that I'd like to try a little bit different with the cover crops is um, a more diverse mix. You know, it'll still be like a grain and a legume, but maybe we'll do four types of, of seeds or five, and I'm kind of looking in more into that. So maybe we'll do the crotillaria and the cow peas along with the uh, um, sorghum sedan grass and find some other warm season grain that might work and have like four or five different seeds that we're planting at a time. And um, just keep trying different things. And with the chickens, you know, like I said we're, we've gone more and more to as much reduced tillage as we can. The chickens have really helped because they basically do a lot of tilling. And so we can get in there and just shape beds and maybe just till the top inch. So the more we can do that, the better. I'm not familiar with what is curdle area. I'm not familiar with that. Sun hemp? Oh. Uh huh. Sun hemp, yeah. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. It grows really well, you know, hot and dry, as long as you can get it to germinate. Question is whether we sell at market. So um, we sell our ferments at market. Our vegetables, we only grow enough vegetables for our CSA based on what we know our membership is. Um, so if we have a good year, they might get more of something. We can also have excess. We have what's called a bulk list. So we're, we have a small farm central, anybody familiar with that? 
it's an online system that's kind of made for CSA farms. So we use that system. People can sign up online. They can keep track of their own account. So you're not like trying to keep track or double entering information that people send you. And then they also have a place where you can kind of sell online. So if we have extra lettuce, we can just put that up and send out an email. It's like, if you want extra lettuce, buy it online and we'll deliver it to your CSA distribution. And then there's an um, organic farmer's market in Kansas City called the Brookside Farmer's Market. And so we go there every other week to sell the ferments. So we're 45 minutes from kind of downtown Kansas City, which is really a, a, a really good distance for us being a participatory CSA. You know, the family is going to come out to do their work um, requirement, farm work. You know, it's a little drive in the country. They're not driving two hours. So, you know, we're lucky that we're peri-urban, as they say. We have... Um, the farm's one pickup site. We have two locations in the city that we drop off at. We have what we call a core group that manages the CSA. And then um, a, a most of the core group members are distribution captains. And so if there's a distribution site, there's like five people that instead of coming out to the farm to work, they will rotate and go to the distribution site. And uh, we'll go drop off crates. They set it all up. They break it down. They make sure everything works well, and then when we come back the next week, we take the empty crates and deliver the, the fresh produce. So it's nice for us. We um, can just drive into town. Then you, you know, work in other errands and stuff. And with the ferments, it'll allow us to maybe do some drop-offs there. So it helps make it efficient for us to, to drive in. Um, it's been pretty good. We're, we're normally 75% or more. We're, our renewal is going on right now, and um, we only opened it up to the um, last year's members to start with. And we have 100, we're going for 100 members this year, and I think Rebecca said we're up to, you know, 65 or so already. So I think we'll be on track for that. And since we went to every other week, people have actually liked that it's helped us as farmers. We got this whole extra week where we can kind of concentrate on farming more. We've worked it out so the harvesting isn't that big of an issue. We have a Wednesday drop off as our first for the week, and a Monday is the last for that distribution week. So there's a handful of days in there that we can kind of plan stuff. We have a 12 by 24 inch cooler that we built as part of our fermenting um, project. So that helps too. We can store a lot of stuff. 